All right, so hi everyone. Welcome to uh, this bookseller event that we put together for Naomi uh, and her new book, Clark and Divisions. I'm so happy you guys can make the time to uh, come and, and, and listen to Naomi speak and, and with Juliet. I think it's gonna be awesome. Um, and uh, just so you know, you're muted for now, but you're in no way silenced. So feel free to use the chat function um, to type your questions or your comments or, or whatever you feel like. And then we will um, have a more uh, loose Q and A at the, in the last twenty or fifteen minutes of the of the hour, and then I can open it up so that you can unmute yourselves. Um, it's just that there's going to be like thirty of us, so there's that's quite a lot of a lot of people. Um, so, uh, without further ado, Juliet, if you would take over. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for setting this up, and thank you all for being here. I just want to say. Um, for booksellers in the audience who have held these virtual events, I think that we usually say a 50% turnout is pretty good, right? Obviously, booksellers are a, a cut above the ordinary human being because you guys are here approaching 100% turnout. So thank you all so, so much. I know you're so busy. Um, I'm here to talk about a book that I'm just so excited about. I, I don't know when I felt the energy for a book like I do for Naomi Hirahara's Clark and Division. So thank you for being here at the ground floor with us for this incredible project. Um, I know a lot of you have already read it because you've sent us your feedback. Thank you. Uh, so bear with me. I'm going to give a little pitch for the people who haven't. Clark and Division is set mostly in Chicago in 1944. Uh, right in the heart of World War II, and it features a 20-year-old Japanese-American woman named Aki, who has been uh, transferred to Chicago with her family in wake of their release from incarceration at Manzanar. They are going to Chicago uh, to join Aki's older sister, Rose, who was sent as kind of a vanguard of a growing little Tokyo in Chicago. Um, that's kind of a place where the US government is encouraging Japanese Americans to resettle after release from these uh, you know, awful uh, concentration camps. Uh, because of course they can't go home to their to where they're from, which is still a militarized zone on the West Coast, and they've lost all their possessions. They, they've lost their livelihoods and their careers and they have to just make this whole new life in this new place. Um, when Aki and her family arrive in Chicago, they discover that just the day before, Rose was fatally hit by a subway train um, right by the subway station at Clark and Division, which is where we get the awesome title of the book. And uh, the coroner has decreed that this was a suicide, so the police are not investigating, which of course makes just no sense at all to Aki because her family was about to rejoin her. Why would Rose, a, a really um, a, a cheerful, girl uh, always always pulled together and it's incredibly um uh gung-ho about proving herself to be a good american why would she kill herself on the wake of her family arriving in chicago so on her own aki goes about trying to solve the mystery of her sister's death um as the war continues to unfold um, as the Japanese American community in Chicago shifts and resettles and tries to make a path for itself. Um, and without spoiling too much of the plot for those of you who haven't read, I do wanna say that there, there, the crime at the heart of this book was in fact inspired by a real uh, crime that was perpetrated in the Japanese American community during this very unsettled post uh, or World War II era in Chicago, a crime that was never solved. But, um, but Naomi Hirahara has offered us a different, a, a, a different way of looking at um, the truth of this specific crime through a lens that is so, um, I, I tenderly wrought um, the 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 loving, uh, compassionate point of view of a of a, a young woman who desperately miss, loves and misses her sister, looking for justice for that sister, looking for uh, peace and and hope for her family um, in a divided country, uh, and with in the backdrop this question of of police and justice and who are the police, are the police there to help us and protect us or are they there to, to police us? And, I, and just the way that this 
very much, it's a period piece. It's a gorgeously raw atmospheric story of 1944 Chicago, but the way it resonates with our current moment and things that are important to us, I found it profoundly moving to edit this book. And so I'm just really excited to talk about it um, with you here today, but you've now heard way more than enough from me. <laughs> so let me actually turn it over to the star of the hour, Naomi. Um, will you tell us all a little bit about your inspirations for this book? Um, thank you so much, Julia. This is actually our first event together. So sure. when you were describing the book, I was kind of getting teary eyed. <laughs> um, Me too. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, you know, I've been um, trying to capture, I, I see that we have at least one Japanese American in the audience, but, and there's probably many of you who you know, have someone in your life who's Japanese American, but I've been chasing like this Nisei or second generation, like female voice for a long time. Um, it's hard. I was a journalist and I know we're going to talk about this a little later, but for a Japanese American newspaper. So this was, you know, I'm very much enmeshed in this culture. And um, when I look at oral histories or when I interviewed people, um, when it came to the issue of the incarceration, war, wartime incarceration, get into kind of the trauma that had happened to them. And um, they always had, the, at least the ones I encountered, many of them were very optimistic. They were, you know, future looking. They wanted the best for their family. Of course, we had, you know, um, these uh, leaders in the community who are trying to fight the injustice. And they represent a different kind of subset of the population. Um, so I did actually a short uh, story for Megan Abbott's collection, and it, 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 it's called The Hell of a Woman. It came out years ago. And in that, I toward, tried this kind of noir piece with Nisei women in the 1950s, but it ended up that a, a Nisei woman had cut up her lover and put his remains in a suitcase <laughs> um, because he had apparently, she suspected that he had maybe killed um, her husband. So, um, and some people really liked that short story, but I think people in the community really, I, they either didn't read it or they couldn't relate, you know? And then I, I tried these other attempts to kind of um, encapsulate this kind of point of view. And I was kind of missing the mark and many, um, uh, there was one uh, actually manuscript that was being shopped around and there were like six women and everyone related to the adulteress, you know, like, I think there's something about, about us as Americans, especially in mysteries, right? We want kind of, we're interested in the rebellious spirit, but I was actually more interested in capturing just the regular person, you know, what was it like for them? And I wanted to, um, capture the voice of a person, like someone could say, oh, I, I see my grandmother in this person, or I see my friend in this person. And that, and um, so, you know, the voice of this book is pretty straight ahead. It's not a complicated, you know, uh, literary feat, but I think to distill it um, into this pure essence was actually a challenge. I mean, you say it's not a complicated literary feat, but I, I, I want to argue with that. I mean, we worked very closely together on this editorial process during, um, you know, during some of the earliest months of lockdown. I think we were talking about this, and I, engaging with your text, which is, you know, superficially, as you say, so straight ahead. We have, we have this normal girl, um, just trying to get by, keep her family together, figure out where her sister is, but the subtext in every sentence of Aki's, uh, the, the, the push and pull, the responsibility to her parents versus to the, uh, to the other ideals she's supposed to be representing, um, her, her own identity um, as Japanese American or as American, and, and then just the, the, uh, the we and the us behind every I sentence that, that she makes. I thought it was so powerful. And, and it, I think it is actually, um, deceptively a very, very complex narrative that you've chosen to tell this story. Yeah, it is so much in every woman's story, which is such a cool place for crime fiction, right? When you get to see how an actual crime affects uh, an actual community, their own jurisprudence, their own um, 
sense of righteousness and, and justice. You've done that here. Um, but but how about why uh, why Chicago? Why this particular milieu? You no, know, um, it because so many people had uh, gone to Chicago. So many people in L L A that I know that well, a lot of them are now gone. But the ones I had interviewed interviewed my elders, they had spent some time in Chicago, mm -hmm. or a couple had spent you know decades in Chicago before retiring in Los Angeles. And I never really thought about it that much until I did a book for called uh, Life After Manzanar. So I, I've done a nonfiction book on this topic. And just to imagine, because Chicago was in the middle of the country and it was the second largest city at the time, you know, now Los Angeles is number two, but you, you know, we were number three back then. And um, it had a defense industry, it had a lot of jobs. Um, so that's why it was kind of picked. Well, this is a good place to get these people out of camp and put them in the middle of the country. Mm -hmm. So before um, World War II, there were about 400 Japanese Americans in Chicago. And by the mid 40s, there were 20,000. Wow. So just imagine that concentration. And the first ones to go were, I think the average age of the, the quote, resettlers or the, uh, of, of the community who came from camp were in their 20s so they got into trouble so when I was looking at some government reports and one said oh you know this was in the mid 40s looking back they were looking at the delinquency rates we're having a lot of people having babies out of wedlock abortions you know a stick up man and this is all in the community and a quote sexual mania a sex maniac who was mm -hmm essentially raping a lot of, you know, several women. Mm -hmm. And for me as a mystery writer, that's going to interest me like, whoa, you know, I never saw any of this outlined in these oral histories, you mm -hmm. know, and it's probably people who were interviewed, you know, maybe they were the, you know, the elite or very respectable people. And maybe these oral histories didn't cover people who are, you know, more in the margins of our community. Yeah. So, you know, so that's why, you know, I think fiction and a mystery was like the right, I like to use the container for this story, you know, this particular story. Because we're starting to tiptoe into this territory. I think one of the coolest things um, in that, that subtext of this book that makes this book so very special and unlike anything I've ever seen before is your own background. I mean, you've really put 30 years of research into this from your time as a journalist at Rafu Shimpo, which is uh, the oldest Japanese American newspaper, is that right? And, and you, were there, you were there in the early 90s covering uh, some of the stuff that, that would then inspire some of the oral history interviews you've collected over 30 years and these other nonfiction books. I mean, you've, you've talked to hundreds or, or thousands of people about their experiences and, and really been able to draw from that. I think that's so, um, I, I just don't, will you tell us all a little bit more about your background? Sure. And then when Soho, when you guys wrote her 30 years of history, I'm going 30 years. And then I kind of counted. It's like, yeah, they're right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, some, you know, I am Japanese American, but my, uh, my parents were not incarcerated, my um, because they were in Japan, Hiroshima, dealing with their own stuff. But my father's extended family, um, they were in a camp in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, working actually at the uh, Rafu Shinpo, and it was started in 1903, and I worked at the paper at the time um, where there were uh, the redress and uh, reparations movement for these people who incarcerated, it was kind of like the tail end. Mm -hmm. So um, it was really important, you know, uh, so I'm actually kind of an outsider in some ways to the story. Um, I came in in my 20s and started interviewing people. And I think sometimes being, a, I, I'm an insight insider who's actually an outsider so people are open to share but then I don't have a political th things are very politicized uh, within the community it's like do we fight do we not fight you know do we go along with you know there was all these different opinions 
Um, and actually my family, my parents were not in this fight. Mm -hmm. So in, in some ways I have more freedom to kind of investigate, you know, these different responses. Um, my, fa my father-in-law, however, um, he was with the 100th 442. So he was with the um, regimental, the uh, Nisei segregated unit that fought. So, um, so through my husband, I kind of see the more typical Nisei story. Mm -hmm. And it's just, yeah, interesting to see where it, things intersect and things are different. But uh, I've done a lot of nonfiction work looking at certain communities, like we have Terminal Island. Someone's here from Long Beach, you know, Terminal Island, which was a, a fishing colony, which was the first to be removed from their area during World War II. I've done books on the uh, flower market and all these uh, gardening. So I kind of infused all of those things into Clark and Division. So there's like all these different layers, you know, like things from my past that I've, it's like a huge sandwich, you know, and <laughs> different points I've put in, you know, these um, things that I've uh, picked up over the years. And I, I think for me, although I did not experience this firsthand, I was like a witness to witnesses. Mm -hmm. So these were my friends, you know, they've now mostly passed. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, from this point on, people are still going to be writing about the incarceration experience, but they're going to be removed. They probably have never met or talked to somebody who had been incarcerated, but they're going to write lovely. It's going to be a different interpretation. Yeah. So this is what I'm contributing to the dialogue. Yeah. Well, I do feel like the, uh, the, the kind of public common knowledge of incarceration, I've watched that change during my lifetime. I, re I remember when I was a kid feeling like when I heard about it, I was shocked and that most people didn't know about it. And now I think we've entered a phase where more, more Americans are aware of what happened and the injustice of what happened. Um, of course, it's become politicized in a whole different way. But even so, I don't know that I've ever read anything about the aftermath. Uh, and, and just the importance of that story, the trauma of losing your home, you know, having your family your family business taken away from you or the land that you your your four four fathers and mothers saved up to buy on top of the um you know restrictive immigration policies and then the the surveillance and all of all of the traumas that this community was suffering all together at this one time i've never read anything like that and and you know coming into this story i was like why aren't we talking about this this is relevant like the 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 story doesn't end with the concentration camps it it goes on it it ripples through generations it's kind of like what we've all been going through with the pandemic right mm -hmm. it's not only the pandemic itself but like the opening up and kind of leaving our homes and saying well what's out there and you know i think you know in los angeles you see so many homeless community you know tents out there and and there's there's going to I think it the pandemic for us has illustrated kind of like the weaknesses in our society. And I think uh, with this whole incarceration too, like the how people uh, go back to their communities. And um, I think there, there have been some historic um, um, things written about this time period. However, I think the fact that there's a crime that happens mm -hmm. um, in this book, it puts everything to the forefront, mm -hmm. you know, the trauma, because I think in these other um, accounts, people are just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they don't want to think about what's happened to them or the, you know, liber their civil liberties were taken away. They want to just, you know, go mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that Rose has died, you know, and this is someone that Aki has revered and idolized and she can't pretend that there's been no losses, yeah. you know? So I think that's um, kind of the beauty of the mystery genre because it kind of forces, maybe yeah. if Rose hadn't died, you know, yeah. it'd be a very different story yeah. for, you know, Aki. Yeah. Um, I do think we have a lot of uh, California booksellers with us today. And um, of course, you being a California person, 
yourself, I think we should give them a little gift of, of telling them what the follow-up to Clark and division is going to be so that they know it's coming. Um, so the follow-up is going to be evergreen. And if um, anybody knows LA, well, you know Boyle Heights and Evergreen Cemetery. Um, and uh, that's a, an area, it's right next to East LA where immigrants or people who are disenfranchised kind of lived for a time being and then moved to different neighborhoods. So, um, so we're going to find out what happens to Aki and her family as she uh, maneuvers back to Los Angeles her home um, and uh, it's gonna be interesting. I'm gonna also be touching on Little Tokyo, which was called Bronzeville during World War II and um, African-Americans from the deep South had um, work, come to work in the defense industry in California. And of course, because of our racial covenants, it's like, oh, okay, there's this space here where a lot of Japanese people used to live. You move in there, you know, and a, you know, there was, it was very overcrowded, but there was also a very vibrant jazz club and things like that. So this is going to be my challenge. I mean, Chicago was a challenge too, because I don't live there, but I think LA will be, will hold its own challenge. Um, I will say for, I noticed about, someone mentioned about Chicago, there's, um, um, in terms of the research, there's, some experts in Chicago, which, and when I went over there to um, do research, I went through uh, one in gentleman, um, Eric Matsunaga, which helped, who helped us with our map, this really neat map that's going to be in the book. Um, he took me around to Clark and Division. And of course, if you know Clark and Division, there's hardly anything left. When I was there, there was an LA tanning salon that <laughs> just showed you how strange things were. But, um, but I could kind of envision what had been there in the 1940s. So as long as we're talking about the objet of the book, Naomi, would you go ahead and hold up your galley? I can't hold up a galley. There you go. If you guys are on speaker view, talk Naomi so they can hear you. Hello, hello. Hello, this is a galley. <laughs> I can't hold up the galley because this is such a, a sought after commodity that I don't even have one. Okay, so if any of you in the audience already have your galleys, you hang on to those and you sell them on eBay for a lot of money in a couple of years. Okay, um, but yeah, the, we have a really neat map of 1944 Chicago that, that was so wonderfully developed that's going to be in the finished book. It's going to be beautiful. I'm, I'm so excited. Um, we are almost at the uh, half hour point, so I'm going to ask Naomi a couple more questions, but I did want to formally um, invite anyone who wants to ask questions to go ahead, you can put them in the chat, um, or, I mean, this is an intimate enough group and you're all very respectful people, so if you want to speak up, you can do that too, but, um, but yeah, so I guess the, the one thing I want is going to be hard, hard to uh, sum it all up, but the book is definitely a confection of not only what we've talked about in the Japanese American post incarceration experience, but there's a lot of other wonderful um, period anecdotes and vignettes uh, throughout. I mean, for, for me, some of the things that really resonated, Aki ends up getting a job in a gorgeous Chicago library um, and the, the world you build around her employment there. Plus, I mean, looking at um, things like her, her fashion, uh, her style, her wartime style, and her social life, uh, as she tries mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, kind of work through the the like the normalcy of her very abnormal existence. Um, I, I'm just wondering about some of those threads. Are are there any of the kind of secondary characters you particularly want to talk about who were inspired uh, by anyone you may have met during interviews or in research? Or were there any of those uh, plot point elements that particularly you drew from one uh, source of inspiration or another? Well, certainly um, there's uh, Sue Kunitomi Embry. She was the civil rights leader that enabled Manzanar to be a, a national historic site. And um, she was a friend. Um, she worked at the Newberry Library. Mm -hmm. So that uh, when Eric was giving me a tour, I said, oh, I want to see where Sue worked. 
he hadn't even really been in there. So, um, so we walked in and go, wow, this is so cool. And then Sue had told me that she actually had a good experience in Chicago. Mm. And um, for her, it was working in a more integrated, you know, atmosphere, you know, whereas in California, she was more, you know, um, cocooned in the Japanese community. So, um, so I go, oh, I got to I got to do this in that bug house square, you know, where yeah. people were um, standing and saying, you know, various political speeches. And that was interesting, too, because Sue was very political. And I was going, how did she get so political? And in my mind, she's not alive for me to ask her. But I was wondering, just going to, you know, walking through this park and hearing those conversations affected her. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there is, a there's romance in the book. And I, I always like writing about men. I, I think that's been interesting um, because there are a lot of men, including my husband, who doesn't actually read everything I write. He was like glued to the arc. So that was a good sign. I was going, oh, okay. And um, <laughs> I wanted to, sh- I mean, you know, there's been a lot of emas- emasculation of the Asian male, you know, in a lot of in movies I think it's kind of changing I mean I'm an older person so I saw more of that myself and just to have like hot-blooded men you know (laughs) in their um handsome men you know kind of threat you know very macho guys I thought uh you know really reflected the the Nisei men if you look at old photos it's like whoa, these guys were hot, you know? So I wanted to kind of um, also include that kind of aspect. In, in and gentlemen too, though. You have some very yeah. nice gentlemen in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I think the, it is a, a, a dark and sad crime that is the linchpin of the story, but really the book is so full of heart. It's it's person, it's personality driven, it's family driven. And Aki is such a loving and tender narrator that even when she's going through these uh, darker moments and these personal moments of bravery, I, I just, you relate to her so much. You just can't help it. So, you know, that's what I think. I think she's gonna be the ambassador of this book to every reader. We're not just talking about crime readers. I think this is a book clubable book. Um, I, I mean, it's just so, so easy to talk about in so many ways. All right, I'm at my half, half hour mark. So I would like to formally open it up to the audience in case anyone would like to ask any questions. Meanwhile, I'm gonna read the comments. Don't be shy bookseller friends. I also just allowed it so that you can unmute yourself if you like, um, if you want to jump in at any point, but uh, feel free to use the chat as well. Oh, ah, got it. Got the scroll. I'm going to read some of these comments out loud now. They're all being very polite. Um, Audrey says, um, yes, loved Naomi's Clark and Division and her earlier mysteries. Naomi, we didn't even talk about Mas Arai, but yeah, so I I I had read Naomi's Mas Arai series, which was how we connected originally. I'm I'm just excited to see you do this female protagonist with the same uh, relish with which she wrote a septuagenarian, uh, somewhat uh, tight-lipped male gardener character. I, your your uh, versatility as an author is incredible. Um, Hello from Memphis. Hello from East City Bookshop in Washington, D.C. We have ge- great geographical diversity. Um, Michael from Chaucer's in Santa Barbara. OK, um, Alana Haley says, I worked for Nobi Yomakoshi right out of the college in the middle 80s. He'd been one of the Western camps as a young man. He built one of the largest print production studios in Chicago. The father of one of our photographers was the pastor at the Midwest Buddhist Temple for a long time, Reverend Kono. Um, we still love to attend the Ginza Festival each summer. Thank you for that, Alana, because it reminds me that one of the, um, another one of that, those confection elements in this book I never had imagined was um, the, when the family has to stage a funeral for Rose and the reconciliation of uh, the, the Japanese American religious traditions with what they have on offer in Chicago, um, reconciling a, a reverend into this um, kind of, I thought that was really, really well done and fascinating. Um, 
I'm familiar with that name, Nobi Yamako. He's very well known. And yeah, and my uh, people I've worked for at Rafu Shimpo, uh, Togo Tanaka, he was uh, a long time um, sh Chicago and mm. yeah. Um, uh, Olivia says, um, that's what really shook me about this book, that the trauma didn't end when Japanese Americans were released from the camps. They were displaced totally. I know it's true. We haven't really, in this discussion, talked about the camp experience. We just launched into uh, the subject of the book. But I will say, for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet, in, in a very brief number of pages, Naomi presents the camp experience in such a very, very memorable way. So if you do have readers who aren't as familiar with that history, this book is a great starting point for them. It really is. Um, it, from the moment of kind of, of Pearl Harbor up through uh, release to Chicago. And oh, and Audrey says she loves Ellie Rush and would also love to see more of her. <laughs> I don't think uh, she'll be back, <laughs> but we'll never say never, never say never. Well, listen, Audrey, Naomi's <laughs> writing for me now, so I need to, <laughs> I need to get her under contract for all of the books. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I'm going to keep asking you questions then if these other folks won't, um, are being very polite. I wanted to get a little bit personal about your editorial experience when we were working on this mm -hmm. um, in during the pandemic last year. How would you describe writing this book on a scale of easy to hard in terms of other books that you've written? And what specifically, um, what were the challenges and the joys? I, you know, this was, um probably one of the hardest books for me to write. Um, Summer of the Big Bachi, my first Masarai book took me 15 years. So, um, but, you know, I was young, I was in my 20s, you know, and I was writing about an older man, I was taking on the atomic bomb. So that's a lot, a lot. Um, I think here, it, it was uh, the voice, it was the pandemic, it was you know, we weren't quite sure, right, Juliet? Like, you know, you took a leave of absence, yeah, right? I did. Um, and because you were trying to help Soho, you know, retain their other staff people. And um, so I knew that I could not write as many words as usual. So I was realistic, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of my expectations. But um, I think what was interesting for me was there were things about my own personality, um, obstacles that I had to overcome. And I think it's also because it was first person mm. um, that, you know, with Masarai, it's third person. So I could be the funny narrator, you know, that kind of goes into in and out. But with, with Aki, I'm in her head. And there's certain things I think culturally that I felt I don't need to articulate why she's not so expressive or why this, why that, because, you know, that was kind of, I think that part of me is, uh, that part of hers, a little bit of me too. So um, I think you pushed me on that, you know, to get into, her, you know, like, let's articulate, you know, it's, it's interesting because in writing groups, they say, you know, show, don't tell you know, mm -hmm. but with this, I had to figure out how do I uh, naturally tell, because I think you, it's first person, you have to tell, you know. It's also and, difficult material is the thing. And there's, I mean, there's touchy material that for a, a person to speak about is so, so very personal. And for a very reserved character like Aki, for her to confess those things, I, that must have been such a challenge for you which I mean, you've, it's been so artfully done that she could talk about things like, you know, specifically abortion um, and some of the other taboo, taboo uh, subjects that you tackle. Yeah. And uh, I did have to go and interview some people, you know, um, to, so I had to press myself something, one uh, part that was difficult for me was she was the younger sister. I don't have a sister. Mm. 
you know, I'm the older sister and my brother is eight and a half years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And um, we joke around like he idolizes me. So we have a great relationship. <laughs> But, you know, now I'm trying to, you know, being the younger sister, you know, it was, you know, that birth order, it's pretty important. Yeah. So I had to talk to trusted friends and say, hey, how, how is it to be kind of in the shadow of your sister? Mm. So those kind of things kind of helped. And then on the abortion issue, I mean, abortion is a pretty, I mean, it, it's not the same in an Italian Catholic family. But it is not something that's really talked about. So I actually had to talk up to young, a younger person who had done like abortion zine, Asian American abortion zines, and kind of, you know, talked with her more about how her family, you know, dealt with her abortion and all that. And, mm -hmm. and although it's present day, you know, I think some of the mentality is, is kind of similar, you know, from a cultural standpoint. So... I did, I just remembered, um, I wanted to mention that we did put together a discussion guide packet for this. Um, we had had physical copies that may have been received. Yeah, there you go, with your galley, but we have it digitally as well. So if you have book clubs um, at your store where this would be useful, there are discussion questions. There's a background essay about uh the historical elements that we cover. And Naomi went so far as to uh, create recipes, which she did test cook for some of the food in the um, in the book. And that's actually not even in the printed version, but we, we do have it in our digital. So if you're looking for, I forget, remind me what's in your recipe guide, Naomi, so that people can know what to offer their book clubs. Like, like gourmet, you know, like uh, spam fried rice. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a night, this is wartime, right? So yeah, but I actually eat it, especially during the pandemic. Oh, I would um, eat it if I had spam. Yeah. And then um, there is a little bit before the pandemic, um, actually the Japanese sake industry is really trying to push sake mm. and uh, to drink like wine. Not yeah. like, you know, and so I had gone to the sake tasting. So I think we included a little yeah. bit of sake, which yeah. know, I, is my alcoholic choice. Some sake advice. It was really good. Aha, we have some questions. So from Alana, what type of books do you like to read? And what are you reading now? Oh, I promised you I wouldn't make you give any book recs, Naomi, but you don't have to recommend anything, but talk about what you like to read. <laughs> Um, I do, you know, <laughs> I really do like reading mysteries. Yeah. Um, last year, I was on the LA Times Festival Book um, Judging Panel. Mm. Um, so I read a lot of mysteries last year. And if you go to, you know, see what, I mean, it was so rich. Um, you know, it was kind of ironic during the pandemic to, I don't know if it's ironic, but it was interesting that there were so many strong, and I like to use the word pungent you know, um, you know, books. Uh, so, um, yeah, and I think Sean S. A. Cosby, you know, from Virginia, he's definitely a writer to watch. And um, I had the pleasure of meeting him at the BoucherCon, gosh, in Florida. So, yeah, I, I like his, his work very much. I'm trying to think of what other kind of, I read a lot of nonfiction mm -hmm. um, too, yeah. You have to, to write historical fiction. It's just, right? I mean, necessary. Um, so Jamie says it was really interesting to read about what young people were doing during the war, such a stressful and complicated time, but they're young and want to do things. Yes. And I thought that was illustrated beautifully. It's true. I mean, you get a little bit of the, um, as you were saying, the, the, the delinquency of youth in a difficult position, you know, we, we see um, some guys wanting to be seen as tougher than they are and acting out the fringes of organized criminal circles kind of bubbling on um, nascently in this community. Um, we see young people trying to figure out uh, how sexy they want to be or how what they're, you know, negotiating their first romances. It's, I think it's very well done. Um, 
Uh, hello from Fair Isle Books on Washington Island. Really loved the book. Growing up in Chicago, I have been connected to Japanese Americans through my whole life. My nursery school teacher was from the camp. When I got married, we moved into a neighborhood with several families who had been through the same camps and or the 442. This is from Bob, sorry. Uh, my son's best friend is a third generation Japanese American. Even enjoyed the Polish Americans too. Definitely part of the Chicago experience. Thanks for the great book. Um, yay. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, that's true. And, and I think you do capture that multiculturalism. Another thing we didn't talk about is Aki ends up connecting, making two good friends uh, with her coworkers at the library. And each of them comes from a very different subset of community in, in Chicago and they're communities that don't normally mix. Um, so I, I think that that's, um, do you want to talk briefly about those two women? Well, I just think for an, and Los Angelino to go to Chicago and to see like the European ethnicities, like, you know, the Polish, Irish, Greek, you know, it's so differentiated, although, you know, very different people live in those communities, but just to see like the churches and the community centers, the museum, um, you don't see that as much in Los Angeles. So I think that that flavor is super fascinating. And as part of my research, we do have a Polish restaurant here in LA. So I had to take my mom to the Polish restaurant. <laughs> I, I would research at a Polish restaurant about once a week if I had a Polish restaurant near me. So that's definitely sounds wise. Um, <laughs> so uh, you have all been very wonderful. I know you're very busy. So it's been 45 minutes. If you do want to log out, you've given us so much of your time and, and we're really grateful. Um, you should feel welcome to, but anyone who wants to stay on and continue talking, please do. Um, Steven, we can get them, maybe we can send all the attendees a, a link to a digital version of the, of the um, book club guide afterward. I'll, I'll, I think I need to send that to you. So I'll work on that afterward. Make a note for myself. You know, I'm also working on um, uh, we have a map in the book but there's a map of um, that I'm working on of fictional places where um, we where I imagine where Aki lived and different things we didn't want to put it in the the map that's going into the book because you know it is fiction so we didn't want people to conflate it but yeah so um, once that's um, done maybe we could send that off to people it would be great too. Well, hello, it's Wade out in uh, Southern California. <laughs> I, I wanted to give the booksellers a chance to talk to you. I'm the Penguin Random House rep in uh, Southern California and the East Bay up north too. Uh, and I hope our paths cross at some point. This is exciting. <laughs> um, and passing along a hello from the folks at Romans, of course. Um, and I just wanted to introduce myself and say hello. And, uh, you know, once uh, everything's back open and stuff, hopefully, uh, we can uh, get you to sign some stock and do all that fun stuff here in Los Angeles. Thank you, Wade. You're so awesome. I know we talked about when we first launched this um, and Wade was like, oh yeah, I think we could do a bookstore tour or maybe, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so here we go virtually. But yeah, thank you all for being here. And thank you Random House reps for, for um, soliciting this so well and getting so many people engaged early on. We really appreciate it. Oh, Bob has another question. Are you going to explore the conflict between the people who collaborated, like going into the quote unquote collaborated, like going into the 442 versus the people who wanted to resist? Um, I, you know, in the next book, I'm not sure if I will or not. I mean, uh, I mentioned, Bob, I don't know if you read the book, but there's a little, you know, hints of that, you know, with, in terms of with Rose and um, the responses of some of the other women who believe that maybe Rose had divulged too much. And because Rose was a, have such a patriot, she was kind of looked with suspicion. So I kind of go into that a little bit. Um, not quite, you know, we'll see what happens with, um, with Evergreen. I just wanna say, hi, I'm Olivia. I'm a bookseller in Memphis. I loved this book so much. And I said in my review, I, my mother and you know, so many people that I know and sell books to, 
love books about World War II. Like that's what they read. It's what they watch. That's like, that's everything, everything. And I've just never, it's never clicked for me that that craze, that subgenre of historical fiction has just never hit me. And this book is the first time that I just, I loved it. I loved, I loved it. And I was like, I like World War II fiction. <laughs> and I know it's because it's a whole different, it's a side that Americans don't really like to talk about and don't talk about enough. And, and I just wanted to say, I, I just was overwhelmed by how much I loved it. And I'm so excited to sell it to the same people who read those World War II books about how Americans are the heroes. And I'm so excited to be like, hey, yeah, sure, sure, sure. But also here you go. Um, and I just think it's such a, it's such a watershed book for the World War II historical fiction uh, subgenre. So thank you for that. I really loved it. Thank you, Olivia. And my husband and I are big fans of Memphis. We, Yay, we've been come there. See yeah, we've been there. And actually my agent is located in Memphis. <laughs> so there's a lot of connections there. Yeah, we, uh, um, we went to Stack Records. We went to, you know, we went to all the places. Mm -hmm. We, uh, yeah, of course the Civil Rights Museum and the food is really good. So we, we, we're fans of Memphis. I love that. Please do come see us when you're able. Oh, and the Botanic Gardens there. They have a huge Japanese garden mm -hmm. with the, the hungriest koi. They were very uh, frightening, actually. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Olivia. That's awesome. I, I would ask um, if we could use that as a blurb on the book cover, but A, it's already been printed, and B, we have Sorry, I'm just going to brag for a second. We have so many blurbs for this book that we had to bump up the trim size uh, to six by nine from five and a half by eight and, eight and three quarters. So um, yeah, I, we have so, so many blurbs. We had to debate over who we were going to put on the front. And eventually we went for George Takei because I can't resist George Takei, but... <laughs> Should we wrap up Stephen, and let the nice people go? They've been so nice to us. Yeah, I think so. Thank you so much, everyone. This is so great. And thank you for taking the time out of your day to, uh, to, come, to come and hang out with us for a little bit and, and hear Naomi and, and Juliet uh, talk about this amazing book. So um, if you have any questions, you guys have my email address. Um, I'll be sending the uh, discussion guide uh, over to you guys digitally. And um, yeah, let us know if you ever need anything. Uh, We'll be doing more of these events in the future with more authors uh, via Zoom. Um, and yeah, I look forward to the world opening up and seeing you guys in person soon. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.